Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased that you could join us for this afternoon's program, whether you're here in the theater or joining us through Facebook or YouTube. Before we hear from today's speaker, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up soon here in the McGowan Theater. On Thursday, February 27th at 7 p.m., Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe will discuss his recent book, Beyond Charlottesville. Governor McAuliffe and a panel of former members of Congress will discuss the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville and what history teaches us about coming together as a nation. And on Tuesday, March 10th at noon, Jonathan Horn will be here to tell us about George Washington's post-presidency as chronicled in his new book, Washington's End, The Final Years and Forgotten Struggle. To keep informed about these and all of our um, events throughout the year, check our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside for, to get email updates. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives, how are you, is um, to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the agency, especially our education and outreach activities. Um, and their website, archivesfoundation.org, you'll find more information about the foundation and how to join. In the myriad of books about the Civil War, a large portion of them focus on President Abraham Lincoln and on military leaders. In the museum across from Ford's Theater, just a few blocks away from us, a 34-foot tower of books written about Lincoln alone stretches up through the central stairway. Today's author, however, turns our attention to the transformational work done in the United States Congress during and immediately after the Civil War. In a review for the Wall Street Journal, David Reynolds noted that radical Republicans have rarely been the subject of a full-fledged history, and that in his splendid Congress at War, Fergus Bordovich demonstrates that congressional radicals succeeded not only and forcefully challenging slavery, but also in strengthening federal support for infrastructure, public education, and financial stability. Our nation is shaped by the outcomes of committee work and the legislative processes carried out on Capitol Hill. The official records of both the House of Representatives and the Senate held here in our Center for Legislative Archives are among the largest record groups in our holdings, and they increase every time Congress passes a bill discusses proposed legislation, or confirms a presidential appointee. Let's turn now to our guest author and learn what Radical Republican Congress accomplished and how. Fergus Bordovich is the author of several books, including Bound for Canaan, Killing the White Man's Indian, and My Mother's Ghost, a memoir. The son of a national civil rights leader for Native Americans, he was introduced early in life to racial politics. As a journalist, he has written widely on political and cultural subjects in Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Smithsonian, American Heritage, Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, and Reader's Digest, and many other publications. He's been the, an independent historian and writer since the early 1970s. In 2015, he serves as chairman of the awards committee for the Frederick Douglass Book Prize and is a frequent public speaker at universities and other forums as well as on radio and television. Please welcome Fergus Borovich. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, may I assume that you can hear me clearly, even in the back? Yeah, good. Uh, well, first, my thanks to uh, 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 David Ferrero, uh, Douglas Swanson, and of course to the archives itself for having me here. Uh, this is a fabulous institution, and uh, I appreciate it all the more since my, my daughter is a PhD candidate at, at a university and has had to uh, uh, struggle to do research at archives in various other countries in the Middle East and Europe. Which is which is which which amounts to the torments of the damned, uh, and 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 the ease and and uh, hospitality, the ease of working here, and the hospitality of the staff here at the archives is really unmatched. And I I speak from even immediate experience since I'm working on my next book, doing research on the other side of the building. 
in uh, the very intriguing uh, RG94. Okay, uh, it has to do with the post-Civil War period. Um, this book, Congress at War, is a political history. Uh, and my object in it is to show in a narrative, fairly dramatic fashion, the fundamental and dynamic roles that, Cong that Congress played in waging and winning the Civil War. Uh, politics led to the war, it sustained the Union war effort, it drove the war to its revolutionary conclusion, and I don't use that word revolutionarily lightly, and it gave it the war that is lasting meaning. And the story of how all that happened is an epic, and in its way, it's as gripping as anything that took place on the battlefield. Um, I want to read a very short couple of pages uh, uh, taken from the book to create a, a, a sense of mood. Um, and this is Washington in, the, in early 1861. A pall hung over Washington that January. Rain turned Pennsylvania Avenue into a muddy trough. Even in the best neighborhoods, yards stank from privies and putrefying household slops. The rooming houses where most members of Congress lived and the halls of the Capitol itself smelled of wet woolen clothing, cigars, and the charcoal that struggled to warm the underheated chambers of Congress. Slavery pervaded the city like the stink of horse manure that everywhere bedunged the streets. Although free blacks now outnumbered slaves in the Capitol, investors in human flesh had merely to cross the Potomac River to the markets of Alexandria to shop. The 3,100 enslaved men, women, and children who were still in, inextricably woven into the fabric of Washington life, holding doors, driving carriages, cleaning the mud from boots, hawking oysters, tending stables, suckling white babies, waiting on tables, toting trunks, all reminded whites at every turn that the institution that was fissuring the nation was alive and thriving in its capital. There was a still tentative, only semi-urban quality to much of the city. At the western end of the National Mall, really just a field where sheep and cows grazed, rose the ugly stump of the aborted Washington Monument, like a finger lopped off at the first joint, abandoned for lack of financing. Little had changed since 1849, when Charles Dickens sarcastically described its nondescript dwellings and its wide streets that petered out in empty fields as a city of magnificent distances. Nothing more aptly epitomized the unfinished city than the capital itself, surrounded by the marble blocks for its new dome that were strewn around the building like the fragments of a nation in pieces. Washingtonians felt a palpable sense of doom. The city, Jefferson Davis's wife, Verena, felt as her husband's last days in the Senate slipped away was like some kind of mausoleum with no one visiting, no dinners, no parties, just a sullen gloom impending over all things. On January 27th, Ohio Representative Clement Vallandigham wrote to his wife, I am able to do no good here, no man can, so I sit and I'm obliged to sit, quiet and sorrowful, condemned as one who watches over the couch of a loved mother slowly dying with consumption to see my country perish by inches. Americans who had taken their nation's immortality for granted knew that things would never be the same again. The empty seats in the House and Senate bespoke a revolution in terms more graphic than any of the stormy words that had been spoken during the months past. With the departure of the Southerners, Gloom shaded inexorably into fear that events were spinning out of control and that the worst might really come to pass. Worrying rumors flew through the air that the defenseless capital would be attacked by a Virginia mob, that a coup d'etat would come any day, that unexplained fires around the city were part of a terrorist plot. Vallandigham warned his wife that an uprising was so likely that he might have to send her to, to safety somewhere in the mountains. Others dispatched their wives and children to Philadelphia or New York for safety. Of the nation's entire army of 16,347 men, few were stationed east of the Mississippi, and most of them were in the seceding states. Even the armies 
General-in-Chief Winfield Scott, who loathed President Buchanan, made his headquarters in New York City. Scott quickly recognized the gravity of the danger to the Capitol, however. Although Washington boasted several militia companies, they were more social clubs than military units, and many of their members were sympathetic to the Confederacy. The National Rifles, in particular, had quietly been supplied with arms and artillery by Buchanan's disloyal former Secretary of War, and its commander openly admitted that he intended to prevent Union volunteers from reaching Washington. Government spies also reported a plot to seize government departments, including the Treasury, and then form a provisional government. Three companies of light artillery were ordered back from the frontier and another group from West Point, but it would take weeks for them to arrive. Where would the crisis end, unnerved citizens asked each other. Representative John McClernand of Illinois worried, not only will states secede from the Union, but counties from states and cities and towns from both, and this, the work of disintegration and dissolution, will go on and on until the whole frame of society and government will be engulfed in one bottomless and boundless chaos of ruin. The panic wasn't limited to Washington. Coastal shipping shrank by half. Shipyards and ironworks went bankrupt. In New York City, commercial firms laid off hundreds or collapsed entirely as trade with the South suddenly disintegrated. Bonds secured by property and slaves crashed. Commercial traffic began to halt on the Mississippi. Grain prices fell by 20% and cotton even further. Even the ice industry, which shipped New England ice to the south, was crippled by the disappearance of southern orders. Banks failed all over the Midwest, eventually including nearly half of those in Wisconsin and as many as three quarters in Illinois. Financiers prayed for a ray of hope, but found none. Rumors multiplied of a secret pro-Southern organization that would seize the armories, break into banks, and sack the homes of prominent Republicans. The New York diarist George Templeton Strong wrote, Depression today deeper than ever. Most people give up all hope of saving the government and anticipate general bankruptcy, revolution, mob law, chaos, and ruin. And in the White House, President James Buchanan remained supine. Strong wrote in his diary, had this old mollusk become vertebrate, the theories of Darwin would have been confirmed. <laughs> and in the echoing halls of Congress, Republicans and the remaining Southerners sidestepped each other with their eyes averted, too angry or too ashamed to speak. So this is the brink of war here in Washington. Uh, it's a story, as I've written it, um, this is not politics in the abstract. It, it's rich with politics, but not in the abstract. I'm not a uh, uh, political scientist. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in events. I'm interested in how, how people work their way through events that they feared they couldn't control and manage them as best they could. Uh, and how at this particular, particular juncture in time, the worst crisis that the country had faced up to that date, uh, no one really knew what was going to happen. Representative Albert Riddle, who, who was a radical Republican, wrote, Mr. Lincoln, his cabinet, and the 37th Congress were elected to do anything, everything, except what fell to them to do, fight the greatest civil war of history. It came upon them as an utter surprise. Congress faced a multitude of challenges, existential challenges. How could the North be mobilized for a war of unimaginable magnitude? Was Congress or the president responsible for leading the war effort? Could the Republicans, who were completely untried as a party, managed to govern. Should the war be fought with respect for the sanctity of Southern property, including slaves, or with a ruthlessness that would bring the seceded states to their knees? Could the Constitution survive the suspension of civil rights in the name of national security? How would the war be paid for? Would the financial burden break the Northern economy? What should white Americans do about slavery? 
Could Republicans prevent their party from splitting between anti-slavery radicals and those who were willing to tolerate slavery as long as it stayed in the South? The Democrats, of course, had already broken in two. Should African Americans be recruited to serve in the army? Would white soldiers refuse to fight alongside them? After the war was won, assuming that the North triumphed, not a foregone conclusion, should the southern states be broken up? Should ex-Confederates be prosecuted as war criminals? There was no consensus on any of these questions, and many, many others. Suspicion of central government, distrust of a strong, distrust of a strong executive, and embedded traditions of states' rights in the North as well as the South threatened to undermine the country's war-making ability. Deep racism threatened any attempt to emancipate slaves. Many unionists, especially in the border states, regarded any tampering with slavery as a threat to basic property rights. Representative John Crisfield, for one, a pro-slavery unionist from Maryland, declared, if you take from us today our right to hold slaves, how long will it be before you will take from us some other constitutional right? He was a unionist. With Southerners gone, the Republicans, for the first time, held decisive majorities in both houses of Congress. The 11 most reactionary states were out of the Union. It was very significant in, in, in making possible what occurred in the years to follow. By the spring of 1861, a third of the states in both chambers were empty, abandoned by members who had defected to the Confederacy. Their absence began an era of legislative activism that would change American society beyond recognition. During the next four years, Congress would help win the war, craft the peace, reinvent the nation's financial system, and enact a raft of forward-looking legislation that had, in some cases for decades, been blocked by Southern intransigence. In the course of doing so, Congress also laid the foundation for the strong activist central government that came fully into being in the 20th century. Permanently, it permanently altered the relationship between the states and the federal government, and it enshrined protection of civil rights as the responsibility of the federal government, a responsibility we have to acknowledge that was not always fulfilled. Fear of failure, losing the war on the battlefield, financial collapse, weakness in the White House, pervaded Congress. Measured by the urgency of what they faced and by their astonishing productivity, however, the two wartime Congresses were among the most effective in American history. Ohio Senator John Sherman, the brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, and, and old, in, in later life the crafter of the uh, Sherman Antitrust Act, predicted that the landmark laws the wartime Congress has passed will be a monument to good or evil. They cover such vast sums, delegate and regulate such vast powers, and are so far-reaching in their effects that generations will be affected well or ill by them. Congress raised hundreds of thousands of troops for the Union. It instituted the country's first military draft when volunteers were no longer sufficient. It pushed consistently against Lincoln for more aggressive generals, harsher strategy against the South, and the recruitment of African Americans. In providing financing for the war, Congress created the first national currency, the forerunner of the Internal Revenue Service, and the foundation for the Federal Reserve System. Long before Lincoln became willing to contemplate the emancipation of the slaves, members of Congress demanded it, enacting a series of laws that turned abolitionism from a fringe belief into public policy. The Homestead Act changed the face of the West. The Pacific Railway Act committed the government to linking the country's heartland with California by rail, which was the largest and most expensive infrastructure project undertaken in the U.S. up to that time. The Land Grant Colleges Act would lay the groundwork for public state university systems nationwide. Although these last three generally aren't recognized as war measures, it was the war that made them politically possible. Less happily, the widespread monitoring of anti-war dissidents created a precedent for the government's surveillance of private communications and allegedly unpatriotic political activity that has become a feature of present-day life. Not least, Congress also began a racial and economic revolution that overthrew the South's cotton economy and transformed four million slaves from pieces of property into soldiers, then free men and women, 
and culminated in the 13th Amendment. As Frederick Douglass put it very nicely at one point during the war, the angel of liberty has one ear of the nation and the demon of slavery the other. Both these angels whispered and shouted into the eyes of Congress as it struggled forward through the war years. Now, <clears throat> in this book, I treat congressional politics as a dynamic art, uh, full of maneuver for advantage and endless seeking for compromise, achieving it, failing to achieve it, the trend and the transmutation of hopes and ideals into practical policy. And I generally try to keep this story within the historical present. And what I mean by that is, if you're reading this, I want you to feel the anxiety and the uncertainty and sometimes fear and despair, as well as the intense patriotic fervor and sometimes irrational confidence that characterized almost every stage of the war when no one knew what the outcome would be. The Union victory was never foreordained, as I said earlier, nor was emancipation, nor even Lincoln's reelection in 1864, as late as the summer of 64 he expected to lose. Uh, but this, as I said, isn't, isn't a book about politics in the abstract, but about the men who practiced it. And yes, they were all men because there weren't any women in Congress, so there we are. Uh, I've tried as best I could to capture the sound of their voices, their passions, and the urgency of their battles over issues that still stir emotions. Um, most members of, of Congress, this is the 37th and 38th Congresses, were professional politicians and lawyers, as, as members have usually been throughout American history, uh, with a sprinkling of businessmen, farmers, and journalists. They were opinionated, often brilliantly eloquent, eloquent and colorfully combative. Of the House of Representatives, Representative James G. Blaine, later, later much later, a presidential candidate, wrote, there was no place where so little deference is paid to reputation previously acquired or to eminence one outside, no place where so little consideration is shown for the feelings or the failures of beginners. What a man gains, he gains by sheer force of his own character, and if he loses and falls back, he must expect no mercy and will receive no sympathy. And manners were somewhat, but only notionally better in the Senate. Uh, I've built this story mainly around four men. Three of them were Republicans. Of these, two were outspoken radicals, Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, who is probably uh, the fiercest abolitionist in Congress, as well as a master of parliamentary strategy and the de facto majority leader in the House. Ben Wade of Ohio, who was typically called Bluff Ben, was a driving force in the Senate for a hard war against the Confederacy and who chaired the extremely important Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, which oversaw the Union war effort and held the feet of innumerable uh, failed and failing Union generals and other officers to the fire in the course of the war. Senator William Pitt Fessenden of Maine was a conservative by nature and only cautiously aligned himself with the radicals. But more than any other man, he was responsible for the legislation that enabled the North to pay for the war. Um, I would like to read you, it won't take very long, some quick descriptions of these three guys, which gives you a little, a little flavor of how they were seen uh, by, their, by their contemporaries. Uh, uh, they're remarkable men, remarkable men. Uh, ben Wade, that's the senator from Ohio, Bluff Ben, had remained remarkably restrained. Uh, at 60, he was a tall, angular man with high cheekbones, sharp, bright eyes, and a manner of bulldog obduracy, in the words of a journalist. In debate, he looked at the contest with the merciless eye of a gladiator about to close in a death grip. His style of speech was offhand and frequently profane, very profane. Uh, when he warmed to a theme, his iron gray hair visibly bristled. His voice rose to a roar and he would unbutton his vest and shove up his coat sleeves, tear off his cravat, yank off his collar, hold his arms high, and then jump onto his heels as he brought his arms down. 
his egalitarianism was uncompromising. I know no high, no low, no black, no white. All are created by one God and all are entitled to the same privileges, he had declared. And uh, his speeches are wonderful. He scared people. Uh, Stevens and uh, Fessenden. As chairman, respectively, of the Senate's Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee, the responsibility for creating financial machinery commensurate with the government's need fell to Fessenden and Stevens. Both men understood better than the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, that a strong and trusting relationship between the Treasury and Northern money men was imperative. Their combined energies were worth entire armies in the field. The two had much in common. They were skillful tacticians, lawyers by training, single-mindedly committed to the Union, and bred from the same rocky New England soil. Stevens, though he made his career in Pennsylvania, was born in Vermont. Uh, Fessenden was from Maine. Both could be harsh and imperious. Colleagues sometimes referred to Stevens as chairman of the Committee of Mean Ways. While Fessenden was well known to have no patience for humbug and no tolerance for bores. The self-contained Fessenden was reserved to the point of iciness, while Stevens, by contrast, although not exactly gregarious, was one of the most flamboyant men in the house, a driver, bitter, quick as electricity, with a sarcastic, blasting wit, a younger member wrote. While Stevens was notorious as one of the house's leading abolitionists, the great mogul of abolitionism, a Pennsylvania newspaper called him. Fessenden counted himself a pragmatist on the subject of slavery, yet he could be unexpectedly touched. In July, 61, a visitor to Fessenden's home brought with him a small enslaved child who played on the carpet and chattered for an hour, impressing Fessenden with his intelligence. He wrote afterward to a friend, the thought that it was owned like a dog by one of its fellow creatures made me utter fresh maledictions on an institution which upholds such an atrocity. Uh, there's so much more that can be said about, about these men, but uh, I, I just want to communicate how, how forceful uh, personalities and how politically capable they were. The fourth figure who looms large in this book, that's Ohio Representative Clement C. Vallandingham, who I quoted early on in a different context, was a northern Democrat with southern sympathies and the leading advocate of negotiated peace. That is a copperhead, as they were called. Such people were called. As the spokesman for the anti-war opposition, his views often came pre pre perilously close to treason, at least in the view of Republicans. Although Vallandigham's racial beliefs in particular are repugnant to present day values, truly awful, but not uncommon for his era. He nevertheless was one of the most provocative dissenters in American history and a self-described martyr to the administration's determination to squelch views that threatened the war effort. Uh, it, his story is a fascinating story. Very interesting man, very difficult. In fact, pretty near impossible to like, looking back from our own day, but, but unusual. And, and in his own reactionary way, politically courageous. So far, I haven't mentioned Abraham Lincoln. That's because the book isn't about Abraham Lincoln. Um, uh, I, I'm being a, a tad facetious. You can't, obviously can't write about politics during the Civil War and not write about Abraham Lincoln. But he's largely an offstage presence during most of this story. Not wholly offstage, but largely. There's an abundance of excellent books about Lincoln's presidency uh, by Harold Holzer, Sidney Blumenthal, David Herbert Donald, and on and on and on. There is a multitude of wonderful books that will tell us appropriately what a, what a, what a, what a fascinating, profound, uh, and, and unusual man Abraham Lincoln was, and I don't, I don't disagree with any of that. However, I saw no need, on one hand, to add another book to that particular pile, um, uh, look, like most history historians, I, I regard him probably as our greatest president, uh, 
and uh, although I think FDR runs a close second, uh, and a more skillful politi political man than many of his contemporaries gave him credit for. And those contemporaries are the people I'm writing about largely. But in 1861, bear in mind, he was no more prepared for war than were most Americans, and considerably less so than some members of Congress. And for much of the war, he was a work in progress. We, we think of Lincoln in his, his kind of climactic phase. I mean, uh, he was not Father Abraham in 1861. He, he was a... a uh, as we would say today, a little facetiously, uh, he still didn't know where the men's room was in the White House, you know. Uh, and, and to understand the politics of the war, especially the first three years or so of the war, you have to appreciate that, one, that Lincoln, Lincoln was groping, he was struggling, uh, he was decisive he, sometimes, although he was often regarded as, as fatally indecisive by, by, by fellow Republicans. Uh, he tried to govern more by executive order than any of his predecessors had, uh, but he depended largely, heavily rather, on Republicans in Congress who often led him more than followed him and who vigorously insisted that the power to shape the course of the war resided on Capitol Hill, not in the White House. Uh, so in this book, you'll see Lincoln uh, much more through the eyes of his political contemporaries uh, who were often extremely unhappy with him and very, very harsh in their judgments rather than through our present-day historical lens. Um, uh, I mean, a, 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 one, one reviewer of this, this book was re really incensed that I didn't put Lincoln, Lincoln at the center of the story. Um, but... Uh, Okay, he isn't, but, uh, uh, but I, I will tell you, this book will tell you a lot about how the government actually worked, how it worked and how the presidency and, and Congress interacted, which was very different from our own time. It was not the same. We assume it has always been thus as it is now, or at least in, in, in recent times, uh, now being maybe a little more dramatic than... Uh, uh, it has, been, it has been for a couple of generations. Um, but you'll also see uh, in, this, in this what Lincoln was up against, the, kind of, the kinds of challenges he received not just from Democrats, that's to say anti-war Democrats, but from fellow Republicans. Um, he wins some of those battles. He loses some of those battles. Um, okay. Now... This is just a wild guess, but I, I, I kind of suspect that somebody would be inclined to ask whether this book has anything to say about today's Congress uh, or today's politics. Well, no, and well, yes. Uh, uh, it's a book of history. It's not a polemic. And I'm, I, I did not set out to write a book about today's politics. You can probably deduce... I hope the book, this book would cause you to think about today's politics and, and today's Congress and about how we think about Congress. Uh, as, as we all know, truth is often distorted. The, the truth of history is often distorted by our desire to enlist the past on behalf of our present concerns. And I am not really interested in doing that. Uh, nonetheless, a lot of the arguments that were made by the men of the wartime Congress, still still speak to us. Many of the issues they wrestled with then are still with us. The racial divide, civil rights, the meaning of the Constitution, freedom of speech in wartime, the struggle between Congress and the presidency, war powers, and a lot of other things. And they argued all this bluntly and often profoundly, and I'll reiterate, many of these men were brilliant and fascinating speakers. Uh, you know, I, I'm probably not, I may not be in the majority, but I love reading the Congressional Globe, which was the predecessor of the record. And it's all online. You can download anything in a minute. It, it, it's fabulous reading if you know what to look for. Anyway, uh, uh, the, this book is also tacitly, not polemically, a brief for Congress and for representative government, despite 
our government's frustrations and disappointments, which are built into the way we do politics in America. And it's not something I especially intended, uh, but regrettably, the appeal of authority, the authoritarian style has taken on new life here and elsewhere since I began the book. And contempt for Congress has uh, dangerously grown, you know, to me, shockingly grown. According to some polls, less than 10% of Americans profess confidence in Congress. And almost a third of young Americans say that they don't think it's important to live in a democracy. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think this is, is the, these these facts are what are what are what all candidates for government ought to be talking about. Frankly, not 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 fine points and nuances of health care programs that probably can't be enacted. There is there is there there is critical. Uh, we're in a, a critical moment in history. And uh, uh, I mean, one thing I would say about the Civil War Congress that, that gives me, gives, that heartens me, uh, and I've said this about the first Congress, which I also wrote a book about, uh, it shows us our political men, and they're not, they're not substantially different from the kind of people who are in Congress today or in Congress in the 1790s. Uh, the way they, they, they faced a crisis and, 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 and worked their way through it with a great deal of conflict, messiness, and difficulty and made the country stronger as a result. Uh, so I know as a country we can, can, can do that. Anyway, disdain for Congress flourishes alongside the belief, and this extends beyond the current moment, uh, the belief that the presidency has always been the main engine of government rather than an office whose power is deliberately circumscribed by the Constitution. 19th century Americans, including those of the Civil War era, by contrast believed that the real seat of power lay in Congress. Lincoln was a Whig until he became a Republican. This is a Whig view. During the Civil War, uh, Democrats in Congress repeatedly attacked Lincoln as a tyrant, and even fellow Republicans questioned his competence and investigated his generals. As beleaguered as he felt, Lincoln never claimed that Congress lacked the authority to challenge his actions or, or declined to answer legislators' requests for information. He recognized Congress as the primary repository of the people's will, and he understood that the founders never intended the president to be beyond the reach of its authority. Now, to, to us, Generally speaking, Congress may seem needlessly quarrelsome and inefficient and irritable and irritating, but its workings are really just the cacophony of a multitude of American voices distilled into a cadre of 535 representatives and senators. Senator Fessenden whom, of Maine, whom I mentioned earlier, who's one of the heroes of this book, understood that Congress was a stew of self-interests seasoned with passions and that to accomplish anything required creative skill, tolerance, and immense patience. Maybe patience more than anything else. Republican politics, that's republic, the politics of a republic, uh, is always messy. The founders knew it. They fought a revolution not to tame politics, but to put politics with its often frustrating turbulence into government. And I'm going to end with this by quoting my friend Mr. Fessenden, as he put it, I would not have a perfect quiet always in a republic, especially you never find quiet except under a tyranny. Thanks. Uh, and uh, now uh, we have plenty of time for questions, and I have, been, I have been instructed that anyone who wishes to ask a question should step to the microphones on either side because it's necessary in order for the uh, for the words to come up on the monitor down below. All right, me me first, or you? Or? Okay, me. All right, sure. Uh, hi, I read your book, The First Congress, a few years ago. Loved it. Eagerly looking forward to this one. Um, so Abraham Lincoln was uh, formerly a member of Congress, right? He was a House member from Illinois. Did that help him with his relations with Congress? Hurt him? Make no difference? Uh, he served one term. Uh, he had no impact whatsoever. Uh, he um, learned where the where 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 where, where, uh, 
Which, uh, which side of uh, the Capitol was the House? Which side was the Senate? Uh, I, I'm being a little facetious here, but uh, uh, there's, no, there's very little evidence that it had any direct effect on, on his uh, political life as, as president. On the other hand, he was a political man. He was, he was, he was very, very deep in the state politics of Illinois. And he had, of course, wished to be elected to the Senate. He wasn't. He, had, he would have liked to have stayed in, in the House. He, he wasn't permitted to by the state party in Illinois. Uh, so he was not uninformed or ignorant. And I say he was a learn-on-the-job president. We've never done very well on the whole with learn-on-the-job learn presidents in any era. It took him quite a while. But Lincoln's great depth, I mean, re remarkable man. We know this. Uh, but he rose to it. He rose to it. He learned. He understood the gravity, finally, of what was at stake. But it took him quite a while to be able to really govern. Thank you. Sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, this morning, I happened to be sent an email from one of the Civil War groups that I belong to with an excerpt from your book about an incident I knew absolutely nothing about. I was wondering if you could tell us, because I suspect very few other people have heard about it. December of 1863, the clerk I gather the House of Representatives uh, uh, took it upon himself with uh, some uh, conniving uh, support from some of the Democrats to, uh, uh, he was supposed to accept the credentials of the newly elected Congress, and he decided uh, he was going to reject as many Republicans as he could and accept many dubious uh, Democrats. Could you tell us about that incident? Well, that, that was a great synopsis. Uh, I don't know if I can add to it. Uh, uh, this is a, a fascinating episode. Uh, and and I, 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 uh, uh, it was one of the naughtiest um, incidents that I, I, I had to, to, to unravel when I was writing this book. Uh, the clerk in question was a border state, well, he was a Tennessean. A couple of Tennesseans uh, stayed with the Union, most notably Senator Andrew Johnson. Uh, but a, a couple of other Tennesseans as well. Uh, this gentleman was uh, rewarded more or less with the job of the uh, clerk of the house, a very, very significant job at the time. There's politics behind the particular powers that it had then. I won't go that deep in the weeds here. Uh, I'll lose you all. Uh, I mean, it's told very succinctly in the book. Uh, and he, like other border staters, that's to say largely from Kentucky uh, and, and Maryland, Delaware, and, and some others, uh, were appalled, absolutely appalled and outraged by the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and, and the, the, the imminent emancipation of uh, slaves and, and so on. They were unionists. And, Bear in mind, unionist is a term that encompasses an enormously wide range of people. Uh, they were unionists. They typically were former Whigs, former Southern Whigs or border state Whigs, uh, and were never Republicans, mostly. There are exceptions. Uh, and so any, at any rate, the clerk at the time had the authority to approve the credentials of all new, newly elected members. There were, there were very controversial elections in a number of states, particularly a couple of southern states, but not only. This involved some newly elected members in northern states, and it involved his goal. It was, it was a conspiracy. It, it was indeed a conspiracy. It was supposed to be kept secret, not as successfully as they wished. He was conniving with the a Democrat, northern Democratic leadership, uh, the quasi-copperhead Democratic leadership uh, in the House, uh, particularly with a guy, an extremely colorful guy, who I write quite a bit about, named, as Sam, named Samuel Sunset Cox. And he was known through his entire very, very long political life as Sunset Cox, all because of an extremely orotund, overly flowery metaphor having to do with the sunset that, that he launched a decade before the war. Anyway, so Sunset Cox. Uh, these, these, uh, these, these guys connived to, to um, disapprove the credentials of a bunch of Republicans, and it's sufficient to uh, give what Cox hoped would be uh, a 
was a coup. It was it was it was a parliamentary coup, uh, a majority to the Democrats and and conservative unionists. It failed. Thank you, Thaddeus Stevens. Thaddeus Stevens, hero to the rescue. He had a. I I, I want to say he. I want to say also he was. Uh, one thing I didn't want to say about him was I I wanted to but didn't get to was, he was distinguished by a couple of physical characteristics. Uh, one was that he, 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 was, he was prematurely bald and wore a very elegant wig. And he would, I'll get back to finishing your question in a sec, but I want to give you a bit of Stevens here. Uh, he uh, uh, would occasionally pull off the wig and flourish it. And once approached by a young woman who, who rather daintily said, Mr. Stevens, is it really true that's a wig? He said, yes, madam, and he gave it to her. And his other characteristic was that he had a club foot from birth. And unlike others who might try to conceal it, uh, Stephen, Stevens flourished it. And when he wanted to make a rather impactful point uh, during a floor debate, he would walk across the floor and very slowly with the club foot behind him. And there are more than a few descriptions of people watching the foot go across the floor. Um, anyway, Thaddeus Stevens to the rescue. He learned that this, this, this plot was afoot. The Republicans, led by Stevens with a couple of allies, uh, uh, developed an extremely intricate parliamentary counter move, uh, uh, which defeated this coup. I, I, I told you it was intricate. It, it's hard to talk about it at all without being a little getting deep in the weeds here, but it's a really great story, which is told very compactly in the book. Uh, one thing that may be different, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, today versus yesterday, I, I, my understanding is things were a little bit, not only more heated, but a little more physical on the floor of the Senate. Um, there was an altercation, I think, between Senator Butler and Brooks, if I'm not mistaken, in 1850, I don't remember, but it was over the Civil War, and one went over to proceedly cane the other one to almost epitome on the on the floor of the Senate and had no qualms about it. And how, what what kind of justification, what kind of attitude brought all this up back then, I guess? Okay, well, bear in mind that occurred in 1856, Six, yeah. uh, several years before the war. Right. And it's one of those incidents that looms very large in, in any contemporary's uh, uh, account of what led to the war, okay? Uh, uh, the man who was caned was uh, Senator Charles Sumner, Sumner, Sumner. <clears throat> of Massachusetts, right. who was a, uh, an extremely, very tall, for the era, unusually tall, uh, handsome fellow with sw swept back hair, uh, wonderful orator, passionate, expressive, and pretty ineffectual as a senator. Uh, <laughs> regrettably, uh, but he... he, he moved people with his speeches, but he moved very few of his colleagues. Uh, and rivalries involving Sumner figure in this book. But anyway, it's a few years later. The caner, he who took the cane to Sumner, representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina, Edgefield, South Carolina, uh, did so because Sumner had uh, insulted, or was believed to have insulted, depends on, Northerners saw this very differently. Uh, insulted uh, a kinsman of Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks, among other things, well, he was he was one of these dueling, dueling, angry, feral, uh, alcoholic mm -hmm. Southern congressmen, um, uh, and he came up on Sumner. Sumner was stuck under his desk uh, because the desk couldn't it was bolted to the floor. Mm -hmm. Sumner was trapped, and he just kept beating him until he uh, basically passed out. He was so badly injured that he. Uh, wasn't, uh, he was out of uh, the Senate for two, about two years. And I will say, parenthetically, uh, I was in South Carolina a couple of years ago in Edgefield, uh, also the home of um, Strom Thurmond, a big statue of Strom Thurmond in the, in the town square. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one could add more. Uh, but I, I, I was uh, the guest of a gentleman, very interesting gentleman in his own right, uh, who cared for Th uh, Thurmond in his last years. Uh, with whom I share nothing politically, but who was <laughs> really an interesting man, who took me up to his office where he had a collection of canes. Uh, after the caning, uh, Preston Brooks broke his cane, mm. and 
he was sent new canes from all over the South. And the, oh the man I was visiting had, I may be wrong, I believe it was something in the order of 60, and he didn't have all of them. He's still collecting. So uh, that caning was regarded as a gentlemanly act in the South. Hmm. Wow. Hi. Hi. Yes, um, I was wondering about Seward. I know that he wasn't in the Congress, but he had been a senator at one point. Um, his radical uh, republicanism and his influence upon Lincoln. Also, you didn't mention the Reconstruction and the um, influence of the radicals in Reconstruction. And also, um, the programs that were put through under um, Lincoln to help kind of, I would, I would say they would help stay the course for the nation for people who were the, as America was being developed to, to stay the course with the Republican Party because they were the ones who put together the railroads, the land grants, the public universities. I would say that uh, Franklin Roosevelt would have done the same for everybody to stay the course for the Democratic Party with the National Recovery Act, the CCC, and all the other different programs under the New Deal. Do you see any Democrat presidents, uh, Democratic presidential candidates that are uh, I, I see Bernie is doing this <laughs> to stay the New Deal with um, perhaps uh, with uh, progressive uh, the progressive Democratic Party, but but back to the history, uh, back to um, Seward, and um, did they did the radicals have an influence in purchasing uh, Alaska too? Uh, okay, let me. Uh, there were many parts to that question, <laughs> and if I miss a part, you just you just shout, okay, and, and tell me what I've missed. Okay, well, one, bear in mind that uh, the Civil War Congresses like Franklin Roosevelt and New Deal Congresses uh, and you could pick two other Congresses, the Lyndon Johnson's Great Society Congress and the First Congress, all were very, so very, very effective in no small part because one party had a huge majority and, and, and that party could do, could pretty much write its own agenda, okay? Um, I leave it to you to decide whether that's likely to be true after the coming election. Um, it's important to underscore that, that this legislation of the Civil War era came out of Congress. It wasn't coming from the White House. Lincoln did not go to Congress with an agenda, uh, especially in, in 61 when he was inaugurated. He, like a good Whig, waited for Congress insofar as he could. To, to present an agenda, of course he was, he was faced with the war. And he did take some decisive executive action, uh, not legislation. Lincoln's executive actions at the beginning of the war, in some cases, took a year and a half more, in one, one instance, to be approved by Congress. It was extremely controversial whether Lincoln had a right. I mean, it was necessary, but whether or not he had a right to take executive actions. Okay, so you have to look to Congress as the driving engine here, not Lincoln saying we need, we need a Transcontinental Railroad Act. It came out of Congress. And, and the financial legislation, it came out of Congress. The Treasury Secretary, Salmon P. Chase, very interesting figure, rival of Lincoln's, um, really didn't have all that much of a background in finance. He'd been a governor. But, but the financial... Uh, the, the financing of the war is coming out of Congress, primarily the Senate Finance Committee, but also Ways and Means in the House. That's why I focused on these particular people who may not as, be as well known. Um, Seward. Seward is a fascinating individual. He was a radical once. By 1860, he is not a radical. The radicals do not like Seward. They regard him as a defector. Uh, and a case can be made, um, but there's a lot, there's a lot to, a lot of different issues here, that his wife was really the radical, and earlier in his career, when he was heroically radical in New York State as governor, and in his great speech during the Compromise of 1850, which was a, a, a higher, high, his famous higher law speech, great speech, which I, I, addressed at some length in another book. Uh, that wasn't the Seward of, of the war. He was regarded as a conservative by then, far, far, far from a radical. Uh, Alaska, nothing much to do with the radicals. Everybody, everybody was for expansion, uh, so to speak, although Seward can, be, Seward can be credited with some, with 
with farsightedness there. Of course, he got flack. But when you, when you read about something like the Purchase of Alaska being criticized, you have to look at where it's coming from. Who exactly are the people making the criticism? Now, not just that it was, it was opposed by some, but uh, you know, look, look, at, look at Grant's, after the war, of course, uh, as a President Grant's determination to annex Santo Domingo, the Dominican, Dominican Republic. I mean, he was ferocious about it. It was one of the hottest, most hotly debated subjects of a later Congress, two Congresses, actually. Uh, uh, totally forgotten because it didn't happen. Well, we got Alaska. Sir. Yes. Uh, you said something that was interesting, that uh, Congress uh, tried to campaign for more aggressive generals. Uh, I, th I found that very interesting. Um, was there a relationship? How did Edwin Stanton play into that? And was there a relation between Ben Wade and Stanton? Because you know they both were from from um, both from Ohio. Yes, they were both from Ohio. But bear in mind, Stanton was a, a pre-war Democrat, and and Wade was a a a, a fierce, fiercely partisan, first Whig, then then Republican. But they were like they were like-minded. Once Stanton was in office, and I think Stanton's one of the interesting figures. There have been two biographies of him in, in recent years. One of them highly critical, which. I think it was over the, over the top, and and one that's more balanced. Um, I, I believe it's by Walter Starr, S T A H R. I, I, shoot me if I'm wrong. On that. I think it's a Walter Starr. Um, uh, yes, yes. Uh, the radicals and the radical leadership in Congress was aligned with Stanton, especially as the war went on. Um, uh, the real, the really, the. The, the hardest push, though, for changing generals was coming out of, uh, out of Congress, and most particularly at the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, whose reports are copious. It was actually writing a paper about five years ago about the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War that got me started on what became this book. And I was astonished at the quality of testimony. They, they interrogated, uh, or let's say interviewed, that was the word at the time, interviewed something like 262 serving military officers during the war. They investigated uh, 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 procurement abuse during the war. They investigated, and this, this is something everybody should know about. It's dropped out of our consciousness. They went down and they investigated the Fort Pillow Massacre in 1864. They went there two weeks after, after this horrible massacre in which uh, William, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, war criminal, uh, a uh, Confederate cavalry commander massacred a garrison of Union troops, uh, uh, two thirds of whom who, who, uh, were African American. Just murdered them, murdered them. I mean, the man should have uh, gone to prison over it, but he didn't. He was also uh, the first Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan after the war, by the way. Uh, but at any rate, if the, the Joint Committee credit for going down there, interviewing survivors, and there were survivors. Uh, uh, so now, when you, you get down to the politics of this, the Joint Committee um, wanted aggressive commanders, and it wanted commanders who were compatible with radical thinking, radical politics. That was not always um, congruent with, with military capability. Regrettably, one would wish, but some of the figures that they pushed for were really pretty poor on the battlefield. Uh, so you can't say that they that they, the ones they picked were the, greatest, were the greatest generals. But they pushed, pushed, pushed Lincoln to finally uh, uh, understand that uh, the war had to be a hard war and the South had to be crushed. Not to, it wasn't a gentleman's war anymore, finally. Finally, we get, we get Sherman, Sheridan, and Grant. I think we're, did the bell ring? I'm one, one question oh, over on this side. Hi. Hi. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about John Bingham, uh, John Bingham, of the 39th Congress? Ah, okay. Um, uh, Bingham, Bingham was. Uh, I haven't. I, I'm going to be honest. I did not write much about Bingham in the book. He could be. He he was a one of the most outspoken and most capable. Uh, 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 radicals and advocates for uh, uh, extending greater rights to African Americans, and, and 
uh, he deserves more attention. He's one of these wonderful people who uh, has whose memory has kind of dropped out, dropped out of uh, our consciousness. And I thought I might write more about him, but uh, you know, I, I I didn't want the cast to be too crowded. Um, but I I, I will uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of beg the point here and 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 advise anybody, uh, everybody, if if you have any. If, if I don't answer something about this, I, go, go to the Congressional Globe. Go to the Congre It's downloadable. It's for free. You can get everything in a minute. The indexes, the indexes are a bit challenging, but they're really good. They're really good. You can you can find everything that Bingham said, everything that Stevens said, any anything that all these people said, and it, it's not. It's the indexes aren't perfect, but they're really good, and you can re read it in the comfort of your own home. Uh, Thanks a lot.